I'm Sebastian Musgrave, and this is Victoria's Legacy. Good evening, sir. Good evening. You are a descendant, sir, of a landed, an established and well-respected family. One might say that a career in politics was your allocated future. I think you are right there. Uh, I am descended from Lord Burley, who was, of course, the uh, chief minister of Elizabeth I. Indeed. Now, you had a traditional classical education, I believe. I went to uh, Eton College in 1845, where I, uh, shall we say, uh, didn't have such uh, a good experience, though I excelled at languages and theology classics. Uh, but due to the uh, attentions of some cruel, insensitive boys, I was forced to leave there and be educated at home. Really? Now, I believe, sir, that uh, during this time also you were plagued by bouts of ill health, and that this ill health followed you to Oxford. I was at Oxford for two years, uh, but during that time I did not uh, achieve as much as I would have hoped. Uh, I read mathematics and was given an honorary degree, though I could well have done better if my health had not uh, prevented me uh, from doing my, my utmost best. Following your experience with the law, uh, or studying the law at Oxford, amongst many other uh, endeavours, of course, you, uh, you became a journalist. I did indeed become a journalist. Uh, law did not agree with me, and uh, I, actually I, 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 I toured the colonies for uh, a number of years, from 1851 to 53, really? including uh, the Cape Colony, uh, Australia and New Zealand, which was uh, a very interesting uh, experience. And I felt that it uh, gave me uh, a knowledge of our colonies and, and empire, which was to serve me uh, later in life. Mm. In what way would you say that this uh, knowledge and experience in your early career has helped you in your later career? Well, I certainly have understood the way that the, uh, the imperial system works. Uh, as imperialists would say, that we are looking after the colonies to such a time when they are uh, to be brought to independence. We've given them a culture, religion, uh, transportation. Uh, education, the law, uh, but I think certainly uh, many places have yet uh, to come to the stage where, the, where they would be become independent, but uh, I've seen a lot of the good that the Empire has done around yes, the world. I see. So travel, the law, mathematics, journalism. When did you first enter politics? Ah, well, that would be in 1853. I became uh, the MP for Stamford in Lincolnshire, mm. uh, and I represented them successfully until 1868, mm. uh, when I uh, succeeded to my father's peerage, and uh, then uh, rose into the uh, House of Lords. Mm. You, sir, have been known to be... Uh consistent in your attitudes towards politics and uh, the uh, successful rule of Great Britain. What have been your guiding principles? Well, my guiding principles, are, as I've alluded to, are a Christian uh, uh, base and philanthropic ideas, but also that the, the empire is a great good in the world, uh, and I've always sought to defend the empire. The more of this globe that we uh, uh, rule over, the better it is for mankind, I would say. Um, but yes, uh, also, of course, looking at the uh, less well-off in society. Uh, it's incumbent upon my uh, class and position of power that one should try to do what one can 
for the unfortunates and lower classes. Otherwise, it may end up in anarchy. Yes, indeed, sir. I quite agree, and I appreciate your point of view. Now you uh, speak, sir, of uh, Britain's increasing influence in the world. Of course, we have uh, many colonies. You yourself, in 1866, I believe, were made Secretary of State for India, and this experience left a, a lasting impression upon you. It did indeed. Uh, that time was the Orissa Famine in India, where three quarters of a million uh, Indians starved. And this country was was reluctant to help, to put money forward to do so. And I spoke most strongly in Parliament in favour of helping uh, this, and was given a hearty cheer, I must say, from both sides of the House for that speech. Uh, and it's something which, as always, even to this day, affected me, uh, looking at the skeletal figures of the uh, children in that famine. I still have photographs of them to this day and I think it is very important that we look after our colonies and uh, the people therein. Yes, thank you sir. It's, uh, you mentioned your speech, my own dear father uh, would often speak to me in admiration about that very speech, sir. my congratulations even decades later. Thank you sir. Now I believe in the 1880s one of the biggest issues uh, was the call for parliamentary reform. What was your attitude to this question? Oh, I was against it. Uh, Gladstone introduced the reform bill in 1884 and uh, I was much against it. We've had uh, hundreds of years of our system and it has been very successful and therefore opposed it. However, I did temper it by saying that we should do something about the redistribution of seats. Uh, far too many seats are given to the uh, small boroughs and the counties. And I introduced the Seats Bill uh, in, in uh, 1885, I think it was, uh, which gave less seats to the smaller boroughs and less seats to the uh, counties. And I, I believe that this that system will prove to be uh, uh, longevity uh, yes. to it. Yes, sir. Yes, I see that. Uh, now, we are some ten years or so distant from that time in the 1880s where uh, parliamentary reform was such an issue. Uh, between now and then, as we know, there has been or have been calls for female suffrage. Well, I, I don't think it's uh, an issue of any great importance. Uh, after all, uh, uh, women have not got the, the capacity uh, I believe, uh, to, to, to make decisions in politics. However, if my uh, ploughmen are thought to be capable uh, of, of the, having the vote, uh, I'm sure educated women are just as capable as them. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, sir. And now, during your second tenure, I believe, as Prime Minister, this would have been in the, the mid-1880s, uh, mid you rather controversially championed the cause of the working classes. Why was this? Again, uh, I think it's something which is incumbent upon my class, that we should help those that are less well, for, less well off and less fortunate. Um, I spoke again in, the, in Parliament uh, for an Artisans and Dwellings Act, which would uh, help uh, those that had been, um, basically had been taken out of their homes by building projects such as the Thames Embankment and uh, there were whole families living in one room and this, this is very injurious to uh, morality and uh, encourages vice uh, and so I've introduced a number of, of, of measures uh, to alleviate this uh, building new houses for the poor uh, to try to, to improve uh, their overall chances and life. So, would you describe yourself as a socialist, sir? Indeed not, sir. That uh, uh, label is certainly not true. I, I have much higher uh, ideals of, uh, of, uh, of philanthropic and, uh, and, and idealistic uh, pursuits than mere socialism. I see. Yes, Prime Minister. I rather thought that might be your response. 
Now, sir, around about the late 1880s into the early 1890s, uh, the main focus for you was uh, was in the area of foreign affairs, was it not? Yes, yes, indeed, indeed. Well, there were many issues at that time. We had uh, disputes with France over the Sudan and Morocco. Uh, there was uh, a dispute, actually engineered, I fear, by uh, President Grover Cleveland over Venezuela and uh, the border with, Venez uh, with, with uh, British Guiana. Um, and, of course, there's the issue of uh, the Suez Canal, make, making sure that uh, that is open to trade, and Germany and South Africa, which uh, are, are the issues even today which are problematic to our country. Mm. And how do, do your views uh, in these areas reconcile with the, uh, the popular phrase of splendid isolation? Oh, yes, well... Splendid isolation seems to suggest that we have no relations with other countries and we are isolated on our own. I would uh, prefer the phrase, I think, of splendid pragmatism uh, in that we deal with problems as they arise. But uh, I really don't think that uh, having a, uh, a, a legally binding alliance with a country is in our great interests. Uh, so I'll deal with the problems as they arise and try to uh, uh, keep away from uh, entang foreign entanglements as mm. much as possible. And would you say, sir, that uh, our current focus and our current priority for the country continues to be foreign affairs? Oh, yes, indubitably. Uh, and I think probably the most important issue at this time is that of Germany and the emergence of Germany. Uh, we have had some successes. The Anglo-German Agreement of 1890 uh, reconciled some of our differences in Africa. But I think uh, the real problem has been the retirement of the Iron Chancellor uh, von Bismarck uh, and his attitude of, uh, I think he called it real politic, uh, which was really a pragmatism and trying to find uh, solutions to problems. Now, of course, we have the Kaiser Wilhelm II and his Weltpolitik, in other words, world view, world politic. And this is pushing Germany further and further into the idea of being a global power and a, a rival to Britain. And uh, this has meant that I have had to take certain uh, precautions. The 1889 Naval Act, for example, I provided... £20 million pounds more for the British Navy, which has uh, greatly strengthened it. Ten more battleships, 38 more cruisers, for example. Uh, and this, hopefully, will uh, put a block on German expansion and uh, uh, dial down its rivalry with us. But uh, it is a very important, despite the fact that it is costing an awful lot of money. Are you confident, sir, that we can thwart the ambitions of Germany then? Oh, I think that has got to be our priority. For example, I've now introduced a two-power uh, system in the Navy. So the British Navy must be twice as big as any of the two nearest rival naval navies in the world. And if we can keep this, this standard up, I don't think there is any chance that any other country, including Germany, could uh, uh, challenge us at sea. Mm. And now, sir, to uh, you alluded before, of course, to the difficulty in South Africa. Uh, How do you intend to resolve the, uh, the tensions uh, caused by the Jameson raid and the affair of the Kruger telegraph? Well, of course, the Boers are extremely difficult people to deal with. Uh, ever since our British workers have gone into the Transvaal and the Orange Free State, they have been uh, treated badly. Uh, they have been overly taxed, given no uh, civil rights, uh, no vote. And it is our uh, job as the British government to protect them. Though I am not sure that the Jameson raid was actually... A very good idea. It was led, uh, you may know, by uh, Cecil Rhodes, a great 
friend and colleague of mine, but it was ill-advised and uh, in the end uh, ended up being a total failure uh, to overthrow President Kruger of the Transvaal and, and caused very great difficulties in our negotiations with, uh, uh, with, with the uh, Boer republics. And of course, Germany have got involved again in this with the, the uh, Kruger telegram. Uh, the, the Kaiser sent a telegram to uh, uh, President Kruger congratulating him on beating back the Jameson raid and uh, almost suggesting that, that, that Germany should have some kind of protectorate over the Transvaal. That, indeed, would be tantamount to a declaration of war. A declaration of war? And, sir, do you uh, foresee that war might be a possibility? Well, certainly, uh, in South Africa, yes. Uh, it could well do if, if the uh, worrisome uh, situation of not being able to negotiate with the, uh, the Boers continues. But if you're thinking of a, of a, of a more widespread conf conflagration, uh, no doubt our relations with Germany will continue to uh, deteriorate. Uh, but I hope, I sincerely hope, that we can avoid this by negotiation uh, and it will not lead to a general war in Europe. Yes, of course. Oh, well, of course, the uh, relative monarchs of both countries may perhaps be able to intervene and help us towards a more diplomatic solution. Well, one would th to think so. With the Kaiser, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the King and the Tsar all being cousins, you would hope that they could sort something out. But, of course, it is governments... Uh, that make decisions rather than monarchs. But we shall see. Uh, but I will certainly be doing all I can uh, to try and avoid uh, a, a conflagration in Europe and any uh, uh, wars with, war entanglements for Britain. Yes, sir. And I wish you, and I'm sure the nation wishes you, all of the successes that uh, you can achieve. Thank you. Finally, sir, you have had a long and illustrious career in politics, and of course you continue to do so. How would you sum up your experiences so far, and in particular, how would you describe your position as a statesman for this country? Well, I have always, as I have said, tried to uh, adhere to the, to the highest principles, Christian philanthropy, and also very much the protection of our great empire around the world. Mm -hmm. I feel that I have done that. Uh, one of my greatest achievements, I feel, was the Congress of Berlin in 1878, where Disraeli and I went to the Congress and solved many of the problems of the Balkans. Uh, I don't think now, after that, the Balkans will become an area which will cause any great uh, conflagration in the future. Um, and as a result of that, I was actually uh, awarded the Knight of uh, the Garter, the highest civilian award, which is something that I am extremely uh, proud of. Mm. Yes, sir. Uh, now, as the, uh, the current century draws to a close, we are, of course, seeing an increase in the influence of uh, the Labour movement. Mr. Keir Hardy, we have uh, Mr. Lloyd George, we both have a, an oar in the water, shall we say, in this particular issue. What is your opinion, sir, of the Labour movement and of the possible consequences for this country, should it succeed? Well, uh, I don't think it will succeed, but uh, certainly a party of working for the working class, uh, I don't think has got a, a great future. Uh, the Liberal Party and the Conservative Party have served this country well for a number of years. Uh, I think it is uh, socialism is a, is a flash in the pan, sir, and uh, won't survive beyond the end of this century. Well, you may say that, sir, and uh, perhaps many of us may hope that you are correct. However, there seems to be a growing um, uh, influence from the likes of Mr Engels 
in this country, uh, influencing Mr. Hardy, influencing Mr. Lloyd George, and influencing uh, subsequently the population and the populace. I beg, sir, that you don't take the um, warnings too lightly and that you are able to um, thwart such attempts wherever they may arise. I do so hope so, sir. Uh, the, the idea that there should be no uh, ruling class, that there should be nobody in charge, that everybody should be equal, which I believe this, this Ingalls and Marx, these ideas are, uh, would be tantamount to the end of civilization. So uh, I don't know, but I, I'd rather hope that that won't be the case uh, and that this, this new uh, political idea will, will die a death. And now, sir, for the next few years, whilst in power, what do you hope to achieve? Well, first and foremost, I want to defend the interests of this great empire and this country of ours and make sure that it remains strong both internally and externally. I hope to make the people's lives much better, and I hope that I have enough years left of my Premiership to serve this country as I have done for the last decades and now into the future. And most important of all, I hope to prevent a war which would destroy all that we have built. I'm sure that you will, sir. Prime Minister, it has been my great pleasure to have you participate in this series on Victoria's legacy. My sincere thank you. I thank you.